Would you pray with me? God, we are grateful, we are so grateful that you do indeed live, and that because you live, not only can we face tomorrow, but we know that tomorrow we are one day closer to being with you. We are one day closer to being in your glorious presence where there will be no sin, no tears, no death, no sorrow, but only joy forevermore. And God, because you live, help us now to look to your word and help us live in light of you, in light of your gospel. Help us to understand your word and to live it out. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll be in 1 Corinthians this morning, 1 Corinthians starting chapter 3, but we're only getting four verses in today. Um, But as you're turning there and as we begin to think about our text this morning, I want us to first think through what the normal life cycle of a Christian is. What the normal life cycle of a Christian is in, in the broadest sense is to go from babies in Christ to mature in Christ. That's the end goal. So you start as a baby and you eventually you become mature in Christ. And so before we get to the text and we read a pretty harsh word from Paul to the Corinthians where he essentially calls them babies, I want us to understand at the beginning that there is nothing wrong with being a baby in Christ as long as you understand it's not where you stay this morning. We, we don't stay as a baby in Christ. It's where everyone starts. The moment you hear the gospel and you believe you are a baby in Christ. But again, the problem arises, the problem that we'll see this morning is when there is no growth happening and there's no desire to grow when Christians stay babies in Christ. But I want to break down the life cycle a little bit more. First, someone has to share the gospel with you in order for you to respond to the gospel. And you ought to respond to the gospel that Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, who came and lived among us and lived a sinless and perfect life, He came to die on a cross for you and for me and all who would believe in Him. To pay the price for our sins, our wrongdoings. And that He did die on that cross. He was buried and He stayed there for just three days. And on the third day, he rose in glorious victory for you to guarantee because he lives that you can face tomorrow. That's where it has to start. You hear that wonderful, precious, glorious gospel and you respond to it saying, yes, I believe it and I know that I need him. I need him as savior. And so I place my faith in him. I repent of my sins. I turn away from the worldliness that I was in, that I love, that I followed, and I turn to godliness and what he wants for me. You are born again by the Spirit of God who now lives in you the moment you place your faith in Christ. And again, you're a baby at that moment, but you are a new creation which means that you are not merely human anymore. And we'll get to more of what that means in a little bit. But you are of the Spirit now because the Spirit is inside you, the Spirit of God Almighty Himself. This means that you ought to grow in Christ through the work of that Spirit within you through the ordinary means of discipleship. And this ordinary means of discipleship happens nowhere else but inside the local church and as a part of the local church. Because the local church is where the scriptures are read, where they are taught, where they are preached, where psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs are sung and spoken to one another, where prayers are lifted up to receive wisdom. God, what do we need to do? What should we be doing? for needs in the community of believers like we did this morning, praying for one another and praying for God's will to be done among, done among them. All of that happens in the context of a local church. Fellowship happens, life on life, iron sharpening iron. Burdens are shared because we all have burdens at times in our life. And if we're honest, it's easier to bear those burdens if you're not the only one holding them 
Encouragement continues to continue after Christ, to look to him, to follow him, to love him, to serve him. And over time, as you go about those ordinary means of discipleship where you start a baby in Christ and you work your way towards mature in Christ, the things of the world seem less and less appealing. They lose their shine. And the heavenly things that we are to set our minds on are more and more sweet. Maturing in Christ is happening. You find yourself living according to the word and not the world. You're living in the spirit and not the flesh. This is how the Christian life should look from baby in Christ to mature in Christ. And this is the case not only on an individual level as ourselves as we mature but it it goes for the church as a whole as well the church should go from consisting of mainly babies in Christ when it was born when it was planted to consisting more and more of mature Christians who help those who do come to faith as the church does what it's called to do in going with the gospel helping them to mature in their faith that's the life cycle of the church Yet as we look at our text this morning, we'll see that this was not happening in the church in Corinth. They were stuck at the beginning of the life cycle. They were still babies in Christ, living a worldly life, not seeking to understand spiritual things by the spirit they now possessed. They were acting as if they were still just mere humans. They were following the ways of the world, not the ways of God. So look with me at 1 Corinthians 3, 1-4, and we'll see Paul say just that. For my part, brothers and sisters, I was not able to speak to you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as babies in Christ. I gave you milk to drink, not solid food, since you were not ready for it. In fact, you are still not ready because you are still worldly. For since there is envy and strife among you, are you not worldly and behaving like mere humans? For whenever someone says, I belong to Paul, and another, I belong to Apollos, are you not acting like mere humans? Do you see how the church in Corinth was stunted in their growth? How they seemed to be stuck at the beginning of that life cycle. Again, look at how Paul describes them, this church in Corinth. First, he makes sure that people understand that they themselves know he does see them as believers. They are brothers and sisters in Christ, but they aren't acting like it. They are people of the flesh in their actions. He says that he was unable to speak to them as spiritual people. He just couldn't do it. He couldn't try to reveal to them and speak to them the wisdom and mystery of God and the Spirit because they didn't live in the Spirit. They were rejecting the Spirit's work in their life and deciding, I'm good enough on my own. I can do it in my worldly, fleshly desire and mind. They were babies in Christ. We know babies like that, right? Where, where you just, this is how it works, okay? This is how you ought to do things. And they just throw a fit And they say, no, I know what I'm doing. I don't need to listen to you. I can figure it out on my own. I don't need your help. I don't need the Spirit's help. That's that's a recurring theme for me as I try to help Lydia. (laughs) I, I just listen to me and it will go better. But she just, no, I got it. I figured it out. These Corinthian believers, Paul says, they were unable to eat solid food. They were only able to drink milk, just like they did at the beginning. And again, it's okay for a baby to drink only milk at the beginning. But it's not okay as the kids grow up to only drink milk. That's just unhealthy. You're not getting everything that you need. You need the solid food. But they were stuck. They were worldly. They were marked by envy and strife. They were bickering amongst one another. I follow Paul. I follow Apollos. They were essentially acting like, Paul says, mere humans. They were not living as if they had the Spirit of God within them. The Spirit of Almighty God was in them, and they were acting like that never happened. 
Like that was not their reality. This description of the church by Paul to the church would have been really shocking to them. For them to get this letter, to begin to read it, so far it's not been super great anyway, but then you get to this point in the letter, it would have utterly astonished them that he says this about them. They would have read this, and it would have felt like someone sucker punched them. Had they read this letter, and especially this part of the letter, with someone else's name in the recipient line, like the church of God at Ephesus, they would have read it and they likely would have said, well, good thing we don't have that issue. Good thing we are mature and we can handle solid food now. They were just so prideful and arrogant. And for us now to read this, it should shock us, finding that this church of all churches was struggling so bad living in the Spirit and maturing in Christ. Because remember who this church is. It's a church in Corinth, a place that prides itself on being the wisest and most eloquent. And this church was planted by the Apostle Paul himself. And not only that, but Paul stayed there. Paul, the author of 13 New Testament books, stayed with them for a year and a half. He didn't do that everywhere, but he did it here. And he taught and he preached among them and to them and helped them understand the things of God. Outside of Jesus himself and maybe Peter, there was no better person to help them begin their Christian life and advance in their Christian life and look at what it means to live for Christ than Paul. There was no one else you could have chosen to say, who could do this the best outside of, again, maybe Jesus and, Paul and Peter? Paul was there among them for a year and a half. But even after that, even after Paul left, they got another home run hitter for a pastor and a preacher. When Paul left Corinth with Priscilla and Aquila and they headed to Ephesus and Paul left them there, they met Apollos. And this is how he's described in Acts 18. An eloquent man who was competent in the use of the scriptures arrived in Ephesus. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord and being fervent in spirit, he was speaking and teaching accurately about Jesus. And he began to spoke, speak boldly in the synagogue. Priscilla and Aquila, hearing him, took him aside and explained the way of God to him more accurately. Those who were discipled by Paul went to Apollos and said, you're really great, let's just tweak this right here. So you're in line with the entirety of the scriptures. That man, after he was discipled by disciples of Paul, went on to Corinth. And this is what he did in Corinth. After he arrived, he was a great help to those who by grace had believed. For he vigorously refuted the Jews in public, demonstrating through the scriptures that Jesus is the Messiah. Again, I don't know that you can have a much better start to being a church than this one got. Paul, Apollos. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by God's will. Apollos, an eloquent man, competent in the scriptures, fervent in the spirit, speaking boldly, saying Jesus is the Messiah. Everything should have been going smoothly on that Christian life cycle. They started out as babies in Christ, receiving milk from Paul, learning how to live according to the spirit, now living in them, but as we just read, they never took the next step to solid food. Years went by. They never took the next step. Things were not going well for this church. They had forgotten who they were. They had forgotten that they were not mere humans any longer. And they needed Paul, who they don't really like at this point, to remind them of that. That they are not merely humans. They needed Paul to spur them back on towards Christian maturity again. 
even if it meant shocking them, as he does here, by revealing, as prideful as they are, that they are still foolish and worldly. But I don't want to harp on them much more. Paul is going to continue to do that plenty throughout the rest of the book. He doesn't need my help. Instead, I want to be sure that we don't fall into the same trap as the Corinthians. That we don't stop moving down the life cycle of a Christian and that we don't stay as babies in Christ. Again, I want to be clear. If you're new to the faith, stay a baby for a while. It's okay. But if you've been following Christ for any length of time, you ought to be taking steps forward. Baby steps even, but then your strides get a little longer. You get a little bigger. You get a little more mature. You start seeing that maybe steak is pretty good. I don't need that milk all the time. I want that. We cannot just stay as babies. We must not go backwards either from living as a mature Christian to acting as a baby again. There is nothing more obnoxious than an adult acting like a child, right? We ought to not be that in the Christian life. So here are two truths for us today. One is on the individual level. The other is for us as a whole in the church. The first truth, we are not mere humans. We are spiritual. And by spiritual, I know that's kind of a buzzword now. A lot of people say they're spiritual. I don't mean the pseudo-spirituality that is popular today. The kind that says they believe that there is something greater out there than themselves, something more to being human than our sensory experience, and that there is something greater that they are a part of with no mention of God, no mention of Christ. That's not what I mean. That is a false spirituality devoid of truth because it is devoid of Christ. What I mean by we are spiritual then is that for those of us in Christ who have heard the gospel, responded in repentance and faith, and said, I want to follow him, we are spiritual. We are the spiritual ones because we have been given the Holy Spirit. And we've been given the Spirit in order not to just say, well, that's cool, but in order to grow in godliness to mature through our continued understanding and seeking to understand the wisdom of God found in the Word of God, which leads us to live for Christ outside of these walls in every area of our life. This is what Paul showed us last week. We speak spiritual things to spiritual people. And because we have that spirit, we can understand spiritual things. And if we can, we ought to grow in godliness. So over time, we should look less and less like the world and more and more like Christ. This is what the Corinthians struggled with. They were still looking just like the world after years of following Christ. They were not any closer to Christ than when they began. Paul says as much in verse 3. Look again, twice he says, You are still worldly. Since there is envy and strife among you, are you not worldly? Twice in a sentence, you are worldly, and that should not be the case. Christian, we must move towards maturity, which again means we need to understand that we are not merely human, not merely fleshly anymore. We are spiritual. We live in line with the Spirit who reveals the wisdom of God to us. We live in line with the Spirit who sanctifies us by the truth found in the Word of God. We live in line with the Spirit who brings about the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. The fruit of the Spirit which is completely different than the fruit the world produces. There is a vast difference in the two. Paul shows us the exact difference between the two in Galatians. This is Galatians 5, 19 to 23. Now the works of the flesh, this is the worldly fruit, are obvious. Sexual immorality, moral impurity, promiscuity, idolatry, sorcery, hatreds, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambitions, dissensions, factions, Envy, drunkenness, carousing, and anything similar. 
I am warning you about these as I warned you before, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Those in the Corinthian church were marked with the fruit and works that come from the world, not the Spirit. There were factions, strife, jealousy, envy, just so far in the letter. We were only two chapters in, and we've already seen all those things. But as we continue on, we're going to see sexual immorality and drunkenness and overall moral impurity. This is a problem in this church. They should have been marked by the fruit of the Spirit instead. And guess what? We must be too. We must be marked more by the fruit of the Spirit than the works of the world and the flesh. Your life ought to be marked by love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Maybe not perfectly at first, but over time these ought to be increasing and the works of the flesh, that long list, ought to be decreasing. You ought to be saying no to those things. I don't want to be envious. I don't want to be jealous. I don't want to be sexually immoral. I don't want to be drunk. I don't want those things anymore because I am maturing in Christ. But if you find yourself not maturing in that way, then you need to ask yourself, why is that? Why am I not moving forward? Why am I not looking more like the fruit of the Spirit than the fruit of the world? It may be that you have forgotten that you are not merely human, you are spiritual. That you ought to live by the Spirit and not the flesh. And look, I get it. It is so easy to just live in the flesh. It is so easy. It's so tempting because everyone else around you in the world is doing it. Everywhere you look, Well, they just do whatever they want, and they they don't seem to have any consequences right now. Why don't I just do that? Because the outcome is not inheriting the kingdom of God, and you don't want that. You want the kingdom of God, which means you want to live in the Spirit and display the fruit of the Spirit. You ought to be maturing in Christ. Because you're not merely human anymore if you're in Christ. You have the Spirit who brings about godliness, who brings about the fruit that only comes from Him. The second truth for us this morning is concerning not us individually, but us all together. Not merely as individuals. It's this, we are not mere humans, we are God's church. We are set apart. Paul addressed this letter to The Corinthians is specifically in verse 2 of chapter 1. To the church of God at Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called as saints. And like I said in that first message, we are here together making up not just a group of believers, but we are making up the church of God at Emmanuel Baptist Church. We are His church. We are His people We are those who have been sanctified in Christ Jesus. We are those who have been called as saints. And as his saints and his church, we together are to be the people who set the example for the world to see. We are to be a city on a hill. We are to be the light of the world, standing amongst the darkness, calling people, come to Christ. Here's the gospel. Here's your only hope of salvation. Here is Here it is. It's Jesus. It's His cross. The wisdom of God planned before the ages began. Believe it and join us. But we can't do that. We can't hold forth the gospel. We can't be the light of the world. We can't be the city on a hill if there is envy and strife among us. If there's anything in that list that Paul said in Galatians 5, there's any manner of worldliness among us they're not going to listen 
Because we're the same as them. And if we're the same, what good is the church? We must do and be what the church is to be and do. We must let those ordinary means of discipleship I referred to to be ordinary among us in the sense that they are common and not rare. They should not be the exception but the rule. We should have the Scriptures read and taught and preached among us. The Psalms should be readily on our lips. We should readily be singing hymns and spiritual songs to one another. We should let the Word of Christ dwell richly among us. We should lift up prayers often and every time we gather together for those needs inside the church, for the wisdom of God and for the will of God to be done. That should be commonplace. When people come in here, that's what they should see. They should see that everywhere they go, in Sunday school, in worship, in Wednesday night prayer meeting, in Bible study, when we gather for a fellowship meal, anytime we ever do anything, when we gather for a concert tonight, it is to proclaim the name of Jesus and lift Him high so that those who don't know Him would come to know Him. Fellowship ought to happen. Life on life, iron sharpening iron. We ought to share burdens among each other. And again, if there is envy and strife and jealousy and factions among us, who's going to bear the burden of someone they're an enemy with? Not many. But if we love one another, if we're united in Christ by the gospel of Christ, we will share burdens. And we will be free to share, hey, I'm struggling with this. I need your help. Can you pray with me? Can you weep with me? Even can you rejoice with me? Encouragement to continue after Christ happens. When we do veer off and we do say, well, I kind of like the way of the world a little bit. That's where our brothers and sisters in Christ come in and say, no, no, don't go that way. I know where that leads. Turn around, come back, walk with me as we walk towards Christ. That ought to happen. And if we will do that as God's church, then this issue of having those who ought to be mature but are still babies among us will not be an issue for long. It won't be. It will disappear because those who are more mature in Christ will do those ordinary means of discipleship and help those who are babies to mature. And Lord willing, more and more and more people will come to Christ because they see how Christ changes people, evidenced by how his church acts, not like the world, but as God calls them to live and act. They will see people who are mature in Christ, caring for those who are new to the faith. Not saying, I can't believe you don't get it yet. But saying, hey, I get it. It's hard sometimes. But let me walk with you. Let me help you understand it. Let me see and show you how Christ is so much better than all those worldly things. And it's not to build Emmanuel Baptist Church. It's to build the kingdom of God. They will see those outside, if they look to the church, if they enter into the church, they will see, if we do this, that we love one another and that we love our neighbors and that we desire the best for them. Not what they think is the best and not what our flesh thinks is the best, but what God thinks is the best, which is to know and to love and to live for Jesus Christ, our Lord. But we've got to mature in Christ. We've got to understand we're not merely humans. We are spiritual and we are God's church. We are not like the world. We are Christ's people. Don't stay in that infant stage for too long. Take those baby steps. Mature in Christ and help others do the same. Would you pray with me? Father, we are grateful for...
your word that helps us to mature in Christ. We are grateful for your spirit that reveals your wisdom to us, that gives us understanding. Help us individually to continue to pursue you, to grow in Christ's likeness and godliness, to reject the things of the world, to see the things of heaven as much sweeter. Make the taste and the look and the feel of worldly things be bitter and coarse. And God, help us as a church to be a church of mature believers who want to help those who are infants in Christ become the mature as well. And as mature believers, help us to do what you have called us to do, which is to go and share the gospel, to go and love our neighbors, all as we seek to love you first and most of all. God, if there's someone here this morning, anyone here, whether they've been in church for 50 years or five minutes, if they don't know you, They don't know the glorious gospel of your son who saves those who believe in you. I pray that you would open their eyes, they would soften their hearts, and that they would see their need for you. They would believe and repent of their sins and get started walking and maturing in you. God, we are grateful for you. We love you. We pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen.